You're listening to the Knowledge Archives podcast. Welcome to the Knowledge Archives podcast. We're a group of students on a mission to learn from as many different disciplines as possible. I'm your host, Eileen Farnood, and today I have the pleasure to be joined by Dr. Carolyn Pukal, a full professor in the Department of Psychology and the director of the Sex and Relationship Therapy Service at the Psychology Clinic at Queen's University. Carolyn's research lab, the Sexual Health Research Laboratory, conducts inclusive research projects examining various aspects of sexuality, including vulvodynia, persistent genital arousal, women's health issues, and other topics. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. I'm really excited that I have the chance to speak with you about your research. Just to jump into things, could you give a brief introduction of yourself and explain some of your major research interests? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much for having me today, Eileen. Um, So my name is Professor Caroline Pukal. Um, I'm in the Department of Psychology at Queen's University in Kingston, Um, and I... I teach classes on human sexuality, both at the undergraduate and the graduate levels. I also run a very, very busy research lab called the Sexual Health Research Lab. You could find information about the studies that we do and about my team at sexlab.ca. Um, And I also am the director of the Sex and Relationship Therapy Service, uh, which is part of the Queen's Psychology Clinic, uh, where we see uh, individuals, couples, people in different relationship configurations, anyone who has questions or concerns or issues with their sexuality, with their relationships, and with their gender. So we actually run a clinical service that supports um, quite a number of people in the community. Um, everywhere from doing assessments for gender dysphoria when somebody needs um, a diagnosis of gender dysphoria in order to move on with their um, transition in terms of any kind of uh, transition-related procedures that a trans individual may need, all the way up to groups for um, sexual health and sexual pleasure uh, support and things like that. So the days are busy, but we uh, all love what we do and we work together really great as a team. A lot of the research that we're doing right now, so I've been at Queen's since 2004, so about 16 years, and I do a bunch of different kinds of studies, but mainly the ones I'll talk about today are the ones that really focus on conditions that affect uh, sexuality that are not very well known and um, that, you know, seem to be kind of grossly misunderstood by healthcare providers as well as by members of the lay public. When I first started my career, when I was a graduate student at McGill University uh, in Montreal, um, I worked and I still work in the area of something called vulvodynia. So vulvodynia is a very fancy word to talk about um, chronic pain in the area called the vulva, which is the external female genitals. And for many, many years, because healthcare providers couldn't find anything physically wrong with the area, with a lot of women who had this condition, um, it was sort of brushed aside and kind of chalked up to more psychological or relationship issues. And that sort of stoked a a lot of, you know, frustration in me uh, because here we are having, you know, a group of people, um, you know, who have painful vulvas and who were not really taken seriously by the medical profession. Now, I have no problems at all with, you know, medical healthcare providers. Um, They're very, very awesome uh, most of the time. But, you know, there is this kind of biomedical model that is assumed that, you know, if someone complains of pain, um, that there must be some kind of physical evidence that one can see that can explain that pain. And having studied in the um, area of chronic pain for many, many years uh, as an undergraduate student, I realized that, you know, people can be in pain and that the pain is not so easily trackable, especially when it's chronic. It kind of takes a life of its own and kind of takes, is sort of like maintained by the central nervous system. Um, And it's really hard to pinpoint because it becomes kind of integrated into one system as opposed to like a really obvious injury on someone's arm or leg, for example. And so I applied this perspective that is applied to a lot of different chronic pain conditions. 
um, but had never really been applied to vulvodynia simply because it wasn't seen as a pain problem. It was seen more of a sexual problem, uh, which led to all these ineffective treatments and diagnoses and things like that and left a lot of women in pain for a very long time. And you know, they had pain during penetrative activities. They had pain while they were sitting down. There's all different kinds of vulvodynia, but we didn't know that back then because it really wasn't taken seriously, unfortunately. And so I decided I would apply this perspective called, you know, sort of psychophysics um, to uh, vulvodynia, uh, in particular a kind of vulvodynia that expresses itself in terms of pain that is um, elicited when there is pressure in the vulvar area, and particularly uh, in the area of the vaginal entrance. So a lot of women who have this condition will complain of pain during penetrative activities, whether they're, you know, anything that would apply pressure to the, to the sort of the, the vulvar area. So that could be anything from cycling to horseback riding to sexual activities. And so I actually developed um, these little devices to measure sensitivity in that area. And I found that, you know, if you kind of get creative with your measurement, you can actually document a really amazing and unfortunate hypersensitivity in, you know, the, the, the vaginal area of people who have this particular form of vulvodynia. And of course, this is something that most people won't do in a typical clinical, you know, um, setting. Like if you're a doctor, you won't whip out, you know, like devices in order to measure one's sensitivity. You're looking for things like inflammation. You're looking for things like fissures, right? Like little tears in the skin. You're looking for perhaps sexually transmitted infections. You're looking for a whole bunch of things. And it takes kind of, you know, special equipment and training to sort of look at uh, look at sensitivity in the area and not very not many people can do that you have to sort of be trained and have the right devices and you have to sort of know how to analyze the data and so chronic pain researchers have done this in a variety of other chronic pain conditions so I just decided I would apply that to vulvodynia so I took a look at this and I found if you kind of get creative with your measures um, you can actually document that even though everything looks okay in the vulvar area of these women with this pain when you actually actually measure how sensitive they are um, to things such as uh, non-painful and painful pressure, and then you do the same thing in people who don't have this condition, you can actually quantify how much more sensitive they are, the people with this condition, are to the sorts of pressures that you're putting in that area. And that was something that, you know, really moved vulvodynia kind of more into sort of the pain uh, pain condition kind of sphere. Um, and certainly, you know, I'm a psychologist at heart, so I was looking at, you know, self-report measures, and I was looking at sexual functioning and all of these things, and, you know, a whole bunch of other people were looking at, you know, vulvodynia in a similar way at the similar time. And we were able to kind of move it away from that, you know, sort of an attitude of, oh, it's all in your head, to, hey, there are chronic vulvar pain conditions where we can actually track and say, hey, it's an infection, hey, it's fissures, hey, it's an STI, hey, it's something else, um, versus, hey, it's chronic vulvar pain and, and we can't find anything, but it has this name and it's called vulvodynia. And don't worry, because even though we don't know what causes it, we're still able to give you treatments that have been proven to be effective. So it's been a really long, it's been a couple of decades that I've been working in this area, um, but it's really wonderful to see that this pain perspective of vulvodynia has been, you know, sort of embraced and has really had an impact in terms of time to diagnosis and effective treatment for women who have this condition. And so that was something that um, people are much more familiar with it now. It's on people's radars a little bit more. There's a lot of knowledge translation going out. Um, there's the National Vulvodynia Association that's based in the States that is a nonprofit organization that, you know, tries to connect people with uh, different kinds of vulvodynia to different kinds of healthcare practitioners in order to kind of help them along in their journey. Um, just because we know that chronic pain, sort of the longer you have it, sort of the worst things get. And it's the same thing that we see in vulvodynia. We see heightened muscle tension in the pelvic floor. We see sexuality sort of measures dropping, like people are losing sort of feelings of desire. They're not really able to have sexual pleasure because it hurts so much. There's relationship fallout as well. There's like this, this psychological 
construct that we call catastrophizing, where people tend to focus on the pain and kind of make it bigger than, than it is, you know, because they have no help there. No one could really tell them what's going on. There are no treatments that they're getting access to. So we're able to kind of stop that cycle um, faster than we were, you know, even 10 years ago, simply because knowledge has really come to the forefront of many people's consciousness, you know, not only from the healthcare providers, but we really try to empower patients as well in terms of helping them connect with healthcare providers, but also helping them find the language with which to communicate their pain um, and to, you know, develop skills in terms of trying to find the right match in terms of their treatment. So that in a relatively short period of time, over the course of roughly two decades, it went from this like mysterious condition affecting, you know, uh, roughly 8%, you know, of, um, of women in the population uh, where nobody knew what to do with them. And everyone said, oh yeah, there's no, we don't know what causes it. We don't, we don't know how to treat this to, well, you know what, actually most people kind of have a pretty good idea of what this is and how we could help. And so that has been uh, really wonderful to see. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And recently, well, you know, I guess over the past 10 years, I've been working on a really, really cool other condition. It's called persistent genital arousal disorder. So I'll call it PGAD for short, P-G-A-D. And that is a really interesting condition, um, you know, and it really is actually quite devastating, even though most people um, will kind of think that it doesn't sound all that bad. Um, trust me, um, people who are distressed by these sensations um, can be, you know, like the distress is very high. In, in our research, we see that the distress levels are um, moderate to severe, you know. And so this is a condition where a person will feel sort of the, the, the usual or expected feelings of you know, sort of sexual arousal in their genitals, so the tingling and the throbbing. Um, however, they will not feel any sort of subjective feelings of sexual desire. And so there's a true kind of split in terms of what is happening in the genitals of these individuals and what is kind of happening more on a psychological level with them. Now, it is absolutely, this is a continuum, right? And so some people really enjoy sort of feeling those feelings of arousal in their genitals. Um, and it's not a problem for them because they really embrace them. Even if, you know, it kind of happens most of the day, every day, this is just sort of who they are. It's how their system is kind of set up and they, they sort of go with it. And, and it isn't at a level that is like truly disruptive or truly interfering with their life or truly just distressing for them. So there certainly is a continuum of how people interpret these sensations. Um, but in PGAD, what happens is that, you know, these sensations will usually occur for most of the day um, and to quite a, quite a serious extent. Um, and the person doesn't want them. And the person, you know, actively tries to sort of distract them from it, um, which sometimes, you know, can work, um, but sometimes can actually sort of make the feelings kind of almost feel stronger, those sensations, if you're trying to avoid them or if you're super anxious about them. Um, and it becomes a distressing sort of issue um, where they can't get rid of these sensations at all. So like some people are like, actually, that doesn't sound so bad, but you have to think of that split between sort of wanting them and sort of these, these symptoms, you know, that the, the sensations that people are experiencing. Um, and, you know, I mean, maybe at the beginning of relationships, people feel super turned on, or maybe they just kind of feel turned on all the time. But if that just continues and it's kind of pulling you away from your schoolwork and it's pulling you away from your work and it's pulling you away from family because it's hard to manage, like for short periods of time, you know, these sensations may be welcomed or at least not interfering. But over the course of weeks and months and years, they can pretty much take over people's lives and um, really become a huge issue in terms of the day-to-day -day, uh, function where sort of like anything sexual will kind of trigger sort of an increase in the symptoms or the symptoms themselves. Um, you know, even like riding in a car or riding on a bike, any of the vibrations that one may feel in the pelvic area can kind of make these symptoms worse or could kind of bring them out from out of the blue. Um, and it really can be distressing. Um, and I think it's a misunderstood condition because when people say, 
you know, and people don't really have the right language for this because uh, a lot of people don't know that sort of sexual arousal is made up of two parts that usually go together. So it's sort of the bodily feelings, usually in the genitals, and sort of the, the feelings in one's head, like feeling turned on, feeling good about things, feeling, you know, that they want more, feeling pleasure, feeling that they want this. Um, but sometimes those two parts of arousal don't actually work together. And that's when we have a disagreement between sort of the symptoms, you know, sort of the sensations from the body and sort of the, the, the experience, one's inner experience of those. And so this is where, you know, so PGAD is where genitals feel turned on all the time, but there's no want of that. There's no desire. There's no pleasure associated with that. Um, you know, if we think of things like erectile dysfunction, that's where, you know, many people with erectile dysfunction will say they want they're, so their heads, their inner experience is, I want, I want, I want, I want to, I want to be turned on. I am turned on. I feel turned on in my head, but their genitals are not working the way their head, you know, sort of wants them to. So there's that discordance again. It's just that in, in PGAD, it's kind of flipped. It's where the genitals feel aroused, but there's no desire. And a lot of people don't have the language to sort of explain that to their healthcare providers. And a lot of healthcare providers just assume that arousal just kind of goes together um, all the time and, and is something that people want. So a lot of the time people with PGAD may say, you know, I feel turned on all the time. And you know, their doctors are like, wow, that sounds fantastic. You should talk to my other patients who are just in here who have no desire whatsoever. But what they don't realize is they're talking about completely different things. So usually the best thing to do is say, well, what do you mean you feel turned on? What, what do you mean? You know, do you feel that you feel turned on in your head? Do you feel turned on in your body? Like, do you feel turned on in both? Like, are we talking about, you know, sort of like someone who is very sort of aroused in all components, you know, with respect to everything, but it's causing them a problem? Or are we talking about a place where they're like a person who has discordance between sort of where their body and their mind is at? So we've, we've just launched a bunch of uh, in lab and sort of um, online studies uh, looking at this and just trying to get the word out to say, hey, you know, don't assume that arousal is something that positive uh, and pleasurable because sometimes it may not be. So we need to pause, check our assumptions, um, ask really good questions and then learn from the patient, you know, uh, in terms of sort of what is their experience instead of sort of going with our own assumption of what their experience is. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, well, I think your work in both with both regards to vulvodynia and PGAD, both are really fascinating. Like I haven't heard about these two conditions prior to this conversation. So it's been super interesting to learn about that. Well, um, thank you. Yes. And look, you know, if someone ever comes up to you and says, I have pain in my vulva or I have like my, my mind and body aren't together. Like you at least know, you could say, oh, mm -hmm. I, it sounds like you might have something called PGAD. Let's look that up, you know, and already information, you know, being able to search, being able to talk to someone who, who has an idea of what you might have. That is the first step in terms of that validation, which is so important in that context. So I'm so glad I'm doing this podcast with you, Eileen. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm glad that I have the chance to learn about all these sorts of conditions as well. And also, I know earlier you were mentioning, or you briefly mentioned about types of studies that you were doing to mm -hmm. learn more about these sorts of conditions. And I was wondering, right now, given our current situation with COVID-19, um, how have you been adapting to sort of all of this change and what, how has your research been affected? I know that you've mentioned you've been doing some online studies as well. So uh, yeah. that'll be interesting to hear about how you've been dealing with all of this chaos. Yes, chaos is right. Um, and I think flexibility and adaptability are certainly key, you know, strategies and skills to have these days. Um, you know, on a good day, it's good to be, you know, flexible and adaptable, but especially in times of, you know, a pandemic, it is especially important to be able to think outside the box. Um, and so I was one of the first ones in the psychology department at Queen's to actually 
start with some online studies quite early on. I think my first online study, um, you know, I ran in, I think it was 2005. And by like back then, and it's really not that long ago, um, you know, it was sort of a brand new cutting edge kind of technology because we certainly in a short period of time, we, you know, even just 15 years ago, we are certainly not even close to where we are today in terms of our technology and our online capabilities. And so online research for me has always been part of what I do in the lab. Um, and it's gotten easier and it's gotten better and it's gotten cheaper and my team and they are awesome. They are all trained up on how to run online studies. And so um, most of the time we are running, I would say probably at least 70% of our studies at any given time are run online um, just because we are able to capture populations of interest that, you know, A, may not be willing to come into the lab or B, like PGAD has a, you know, a prevalence rate of maybe, you know, around 2% from what we could tell. Um, you know, we, we probably won't have like huge numbers here in Kingston, right? So we're able to kind of cast our net quite wide and, and get people in to our studies, you know, in a non-threatening environment, you know, they're online, um, you know, they don't have to travel to us if traveling is an issue, et cetera. And so we've always, always, always had online studies on the go. Um, you know, the other part of my research are in lab studies where we actually have participants come to our lab. We're situated um, on the Queen's University campus. We are in a very locked and private area. We have a medical examination room. So we do have medical collaborators who come in to sort of um, take a look at, you know, uh, ruling out some conditions that may sort of, you know, look like PGAD on the surface or vulvodynia on the surface, but in fact, you know, wouldn't be that particular condition. Um, we don't do medical exams for all of our in-lab studies, but we, you know, we the people come into our lab. Uh, we do all sorts of things from face-to-face -face interviews to medical examination protocols to something called laser Doppler imaging, which is um, if you go to the grocery store um, and there, you know, someone's scanning your items, um, that is actually using sort of a laser technology, right? The red barcode scanner. So we use something like that. It's bigger and definitely more expensive to sort of track different areas of the body in terms of blood flow. So it's a really sensitive measure of blood flow. And blood flow is a very important part of one's sort of sexual arousal response. So for some of our studies, people will have their genital areas scanned um, to look for blood flow um, changes if they're watching, you know, an explicit film versus a nature film versus whatever. Um, we also do um, sensitivity testing um, for some of our protocols as well, simply because, you know, that is also a very important point um, to look at in terms of any kinds of conditions where there may be sort of hypersensitivity in the case of pain or hyposensitivity in the case of numbness, um, just to sort of track in terms of what is going on at the level of the fibers underneath the skin. So I really mesh kind of the, the clinical work, you know, the clinical research I do with very, very heavy neuroscience kind of medically based methodologies. Um, that's just who I am. I come from, you know, a neuroscience background. I have my degree in clinical psychology as well. So I, I try really hard to meld those those parts together um, so that we're able to have a more comprehensive understanding of the condition that we're looking at. And, you know, not all of our studies are on clinical populations. Sometimes we're like, hey, what are the mechanisms of arousal, um, you know, in, in university age students, given sort of the type of method that we're using, uh, you know, to measure it? How good is the LDI versus some other device at measuring arousal in healthy samples? And so we have lots of good luck recruiting healthy, you know, university aged people for a study. Um, it's harder to recruit our clinical samples for sure, just because it's, you know, it's more rare, but uh, we have a pretty good track record of our um, participation. And sometimes we have to get creative with our recruitment. And so for the PGAD study right now, we focused on, everything's on hold, like in terms of our online studies, we're still doing our online studies. We actually created and, you know, sort of, launched a whole bunch during sort of the last six months during the shutdown. Um, our in-lab studies have been paused. So they've been paused since mid-March. 
during the time of sort of the lockdown here in Kingston, we also locked our locked our lab um, and everyone is working remotely, but we are still, um, Queen's is allowing some in-person research to, um, to go on at this time. And we just received approval for our PGAD study um, to go ahead and uh, start. And so we're just getting our team members together. We've ordered all the PPE. We have been disinfecting the lab. We're making sure the equipment's in good running condition. So probably by September, we'll, uh, probably mid-September, we'll be having people come in. Very safe, um, you know, and pristine <laughs> environment. Um, but uh, we have been able to still continue with our work, thankfully. Um, given our adapt, uh, given sort of just the skills we have with running online research, and it, the, you know the response has been amazing. We have had, I guess, a lot of people are homebound, and you know, uh, we do a lot of social media advertising, and we've had a lot of um, individuals um, part participate in our online studies. And I can't really compare really pre-COVID because our numbers really depend on sort of what studies we are doing, but we have had very nice response rates for, for our surveys. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I guess it's really lucky in that sense that you have been actively working on online studies prior to COVID. Um, yeah. But also, fingers crossed that everything goes well and you guys will be back in the lab by September. I hope um, so. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, and I just want to shift the conversation over to the field of sexual health as a whole. I know recently we've seen a lot more initiatives in place that are trying to sort of break this stigma surrounding sexual health. And I was wondering, given all of your years of experience in this field, um, what have been some of these major stereotypes that you've recognized that are associated with sexual health? And building off of that, what are some of the ways in which we could break this stigma? Yeah, that's a really, really good question. Um, you know, when I started as an undergrad in the area of sexuality research, I was a research assistant um, at one of the labs uh, at McGill in the psychology department. It was sort of a taboo kind of thing to do. Um, people uh, were uncomfortable, a lot of people. Some people <laughs> were not. I would just be, you know, sometimes I would sort of say what I was doing and, and that would either shut the conversation down, which was most of the time, um, or actually I would be stuck in a two hour conversation with someone on a plane, you know, for example, um, who had lots and lots of questions about things. Mm -hmm. um, but over the past, you know, 20 years or so, um, I have found that there are less people, there are still people who are super uncomfortable with what I do. I usually, people are like, oh, what do you study? And I say something like, um, health psychology and then they're like well you know what do you mean and I'm like oh women's health and then then it usually goes to oh what in particular of women's health like pregnancy postpartum stuff cancer and I say women's sexual health and that's usually the point at which the person will decide whether this conversation will continue or not so in the past I'd say that that would usually be sort of the end of the conversation for many people uh, but over the years I found that I've been finding that people want to learn more. And so there's a general openness um, to sort of learning a little bit more and being a bit more curious and a bit more comfortable sort of asking the questions and hearing those answers. Uh, but certainly it isn't, you know, the vast majority of people. And so, you know, there is so much we can do in terms of sort of lessening that stigma. Uh, and that is, you know, kind of getting, like talking about it and relating it to people and talking about it in a way that isn't sensationalistic, that isn't, you know, sort of like headline, you know, sort of um, shock. It really is sort of in this integrated way in terms of um, allowing sort of that conversation to be had such that sexual health and sexuality is sort of part and parcel of a person, um, you know, whether they're having sex at that time or not, like it, it really is sort of an integrated part of who we are. Um, and it sort of comes out, you know, in terms of how we dress, you know, how we relate to people, um, our, you know, degrees of intimacy with people, um, you know, our backgrounds, like it, it's sort of part of who we are. And a lot of people I find try to sort of separate it from them. but from themselves because they're uncomfortable with it and it's a taboo topic. Um, but I think that a part of the key is really um, having good information there, um, having a lot of comfort, you know, sort of being able to handle the questions and the topics. 
Um, I know that I have kids. I have 10-year-old twins, a, a boy and a girl. Um, and for us, you know, sexuality has always been part of the conversation. So I've never said something like, you know, if they've had a question about how babies are made, you know, I'd never say, oh, you'll learn about that when you're older. I would give them very age appropriate information. And I always had age appropriate books out there. And I never looked surprised or uncomfortable. But that is because sexuality is a huge part of my career. I talk about this <laughs> all the time. It's part of my day to day. And I really sympathize with parents who are a uncomfortable, um, you know, and b don't have the language, you know, but there are such amazing, great, resources out there, uh, but really it comes with the comfort of the person themselves. Um, and so I think that, you know, we're in an interesting time in terms of sexuality in our society where, you know, it's a massive part of kind of everything, you know, advertising, internet, you know, pornography is kind of out there. And so I think what we, what we need to do and what I try to do uh, with the courses, with my clients, um, with everything, you know, that, that I try, we have infographics, we have information, we have resources, is really try to very gently kind of present you know, sort of the information, point people to the resources and those who want to be empowered in terms of their own comfort levels, you know, to be able to provide them with resources for that or to provide them with, you know, sort of information uh, that they can take from there. So oftentimes I'll give, you know, talks to, um, you know, various audiences, all the way from academics to, you know, people. I was, I gave a talk last year before COVID at Vino and Vaginas, which, you know, was this amazing kind of get together community members who just wanted to learn about, you know, um, sort of sexuality in this really amazing uh, hotel conference room on the water where different speakers came in to talk about different aspects of sexual health. And just seeing like, you know, like the masses, a massive amount of people who are there, even though not, like not many people talked or asked questions, but they were there to learn it, really, really spoke a lot, you know, in terms of sort of people being interested and curious and sort of on their own sort of path to getting answers to questions that they had and really just exposing themselves to the topic. Um, and that was a really lovely evening, you know, for I think a lot of people who, who had attended, as well as the speakers, I was one of the speakers there, and really just trying to connect with people in ways that made sense and made them more comfortable. I think part of my, my job clinically and as, an, as a professor, like teaching people and, and interacting with participants in my studies, is really just making people comfortable and giving them that permission to ask questions and to talk about their experiences. Um, and I, I have a feeling that, you know, certain, I live in a bubble, right? This is my life. I, I work with people who are open to this. My whole team, I have over 20 trainees who are working with me. We all talk about this in academic sense, you know, but a lot of people don't have that. And so really recognizing that some people may not have that scaffolding or that comfort and being sensitive to that and following their lead. So it really is just sort of this cultural shift, I find. And I think we're getting there, but we're not quite there yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I think you did share a couple of good tips, especially surrounding comfort and ensuring that people are in a position where they feel okay about having these sorts of discussions. And mm -hmm. yeah, like you mentioned, it's been good, like especially as a student in high school, I've been seeing also this shift in terms of our education and how we've been seeing more and more initiatives pop up surrounding sexual health and raising awareness about this topic. So I think that's definitely a really great start. Um, yes, I, I agree. The sexual health curriculum, like the sexual health education curriculum has just been improved and everything has been integrated. I mean, it's not perfect, but you know, I think in Ontario, mm -hmm. we're doing much better than a lot of the other provinces. And certainly, uh, we're better as a nation in terms of Canada versus the US, which still has a lot of the abstinence only based sexual health education, um, which, you know, has been shown in through research really not to help all that much in terms of pregnancy rates, STIs, things like that, risky sexual activities. And so I think that we're on the right path here. Um, and I think that integrating it to be age appropriate in the schools is absolutely key and can actually empower the students, even if they're 
parents are not comfortable can empower the students themselves to find the information, to find the resources, to be there for their peers, to be there for each other, and to really, you know, sort of have the information at hand to make decisions, you know, that are consistent with their values and to realize that everything is on a continuum. Um, even if their parents, you know, are not necessarily giving them that, that information. So I think sexual health education in the schools is absolutely important. And it sort of also leads to the issue of some of the teachers aren't comfortable teaching it, you know, um, and that just goes again into this kind of discomfort, you know, that that we have. And so that is going to be a narrative that we have to work on, I think, like from generation to generation, but it is getting better. And I'm glad, you know, that students are being exposed to sexual health topics throughout their education um, that are helpful. These are helpful pieces of information, although I understand that still the pleasure topic isn't really discussed all that much, but I guess that's why you have friends and you can talk yeah. about that with your friends, but that's probably something that I think the education system and the government isn't really, really comfortable um, sort of working in at this point, but hopefully one day we, we know they will be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, it's been a pleasure talking to you today. Before we wrap things up completely, if any of our listeners have any questions or if they want to get in contact with you, um, how could they connect with you online? Oh, the easiest way is to uh, go to www.sexlab.ca and there's a little contact tab that you can absolutely um, click on, um, take a look at the members of our team, take a look at the research uh, studies that we're recruiting for, um, you know, and you can easily go ahead and email us. You can, can connect with us via social media as well. So um, we're at Q Sex Lab, and on Instagram, we are Sex Lab. And so you could easily uh, join and follow us uh, in terms of sort of all of the posts we have. We definitely have some campaigns to raise awareness uh, about things like PGAD and Vulvodynia. We post, you know, we have blogs on our website as well. So we post about our blogs uh, that are published on uh, sexlab.ca. There's a blog tab as well. And we have a whole wealth of resources for anybody who's curious about learning uh, about different aspects of sexual health as well. Okay, awesome. Well, yeah, like I said, um, thank you so much for having this conversation with me today, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Wonderful. Thank you, Eileen, so much for doing this and for having me on, on your podcast. Thank you so much.